This is the SF Productions Podcast Network. The following program is brought to you in living color. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. You can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics on iTunes, or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. We're in the dog days of summer. Indeed. Which means there's not a lot going on in pop culture. So we're reaching back in history to tell you the story of the first major U.S. TV network, the National Broadcasting Company, a.k.a. NBC. It started as a business transaction. AT&T created radio station WEAF to be used as a laboratory in 1922, although it had regular programming. What about a laboratory? So to try out different things with wired and wireless broadcasting and all this? Yeah, gotcha. Actually, it was part of an embryonic radio network with other stations in Providence, WJAR, and Washington, D.C., WCAP. Meanwhile, RCA was trying to sell radios and you needed programming to do that. At Westinghouse, an RCA shareholder had a New Jersey station called WJZ. RCA wanted to have a network, but they needed AT&T's phone lines to do it, and AT&T said, nope. By 1925, RCA ended up buying out WEAF and WCAP because AT&T had decided to concentrate on phone service and get out of the radio business, Mm -hmm. and that included an agreement for use of those phone lines. Okay. WCAP was merged with an existing RCA station, WRC, and announced a new radio network, the National Broadcasting Company, in 1926. Woo! (laughs) The network was owned by RCA, 50%, and General Electric, who founded and owned RCA, had 30%, and Westinghouse had 20%. By 1927, NBC was split into two separate networks. WEAF was the flagship of NBC Red, with commercial, a.k.a. sponsored programming. Mm -hmm. WJZ was the flagship of NBC Blue, with sustaining, a.k.a. non-sponsored programming. Why the colors? It's either based on pushpins they used on a map, double-ended red and blue colored pencils. Yeah, one of those two. They usually use pushpins, or they had these color pencils that somebody just had there, and like, ah, oh, use that. Yeah. Rather quickly, there were two more colors. Orange was the Pacific Coast Network carrying red shows, <laughs> and gold did the same for blue shows. That should be green. Oh, y- you sorry. Think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was even a white network that used shortwave radio. These were all merged or dropped later. In 1930, GE was charged with antitrust and forced to divest RCA slash NBC, creating a separate company. At that point, RCA moved into Rockefeller Center in New York City, and 30 Rock was born. RCA's president, David Sarnoff, was reportedly one of the first telegraph operators to confirm the fate of the Titanic. The classic three tones, G-E-C, became NBC's trademark literally in 1931. (laughs) Supposedly, the notes are not a reference to the General Electric Company, but it seems like quite the coincidence Mm -hmm. if they're not. By the mid-30s, the U.S. FCC was looking into what had become a radio duopoly between NBC and CBS. After years of investigations and appeals, NBC was forced to divest either NBC Red or NBC Blue. They sold the latter, remember that was the sustaining network, the non-commercial network, essentially, to Edward J. Noble, the head of Lifesavers, yes, the candy. It was renamed the American Broadcasting Company, (laughs) ABC. NBC's first position in radio gave it the best and most powerful stations, giving it a leg up over CBS for decades. And it didn't hurt that they had the most prestigious set of talent, Jack Benny, Bob Hope, Burns and Allen, Toscanini's NBC Symphony, Fibber McGee and Molly. I like Fibber McGee and Molly. (laughs) But this all changed in the late 40s with two words. Production company. Tax attorneys proposed that radio stars create such mechanisms to be taxed at a lower corporate rate rather than the personal rate. Many stars would hire themselves to the production company and pay themselves a dollar a year. Mm Mm-hmm. CBS was fine with this and began luring NBC stars over to them. When NBC was asked about it, David Sarnoff, now general, due to his work in radio and radar technology during the war, 
said it was unpatriotic and refused. Of course, radio was on its way out. RCA had been working on television since the beginning and had used its government connections to take over patents as they became available. By 1939, RCA slash NBC introduced what we know as TV at the World's Fair, with FDR giving an address and obviously the first president on TV. Only about 1,100 people saw it, either lab technicians or early, early, early adopters. <laughs> Sets were on sale a year earlier from multiple vendors, just in anticipation that NBC was going to start programming. So they wouldn't have gotten anything until this or came a year. <laughs> You'd have a box in your house for a year that did nothing. The first network TV program over experimental stations in New York City and Schenectady who had a mountain tower and they picked it up from in the New York City station and just rebroadcast it was in January 1940, a play called Meet the Wife. A few more experiments later, they had the Republican National Convention in New York City, there were baseball games, etc. NBC TV officially went live in July 1941 just in time for World War II, when all TV programming was shut down. Things started again by 1944, with the first regular schedule including The Voice of Firestone Televues, which was a spin-off of their radio series. And they had a lucky break in 1947 when two New York teams, the Yankees and the Dodgers, were in the World Series. Television sales boomed. More firsts. First TV star, Milton Berle, 1948. Movie theaters would supposedly close when he was on. The first opera written for TV, A Mall in the Night Visitors, 1951. First transcontinental broadcast, 1951, made available due to the transcontinental cable. Until then, West Coast stations would get what they called kinescopes of East Coast shows and vice versa. And that was pointing a film camera at a TV set. And they're not very good quality. First morning program, The Today Show, 1952. Until then, TV stations rarely went on the air until afternoon. Mm -hmm. And then the first late night program, The Tonight Show, 1954. Until then, stations went off the air after prime time. And at this point, they were still going off the air at, you know... Right, which they don't midnight. anymore. Midnight. Yeah. Color TV was the next frontier. NBC had a compatible color system, which was lower quality, but could be seen on current black and white sets. CBS used a color wheel in front of the screen to create what could have eventually been a better quality picture, but required replacement of all existing equipment and sets. Amazingly, the FCC initially went with CBS, but RCA used their connections to flip the decision. During this period, the FCC froze all new station license requests, which gave NBC and CBS an even larger advantage over ABC, who was still trying to build up a network, and Dumont, which was decimated by the decision and was gone by the mid-50s. You can check out episode 99 for more details on Dumont and the other fourth networks. NBC pushed color programming for decades when most people didn't even have color TV sets. The Peacock logo was introduced in 1956 when virtually no one could see the colors. By 1965, though, they were the all-color network, although there were a few stragglers. NBC started to have issues by the 1970s, when an aging audience and bad decisions occurred on TV shows. By 1975, none of the new shows that season got a pickup for a second season, with one exception, Saturday Night Live. The Peacock logo was dropped and replaced with a stylized N. It would, they don't worry, the, the Peacock will be back by the early 80s. Fred Silverman was lured over from ABC where he had taken that network from worst to first in a few years. That happened in 1978. However, the man they called the man with the golden gut struck out with disasters like Hello Larry, Super Train, and Pink Lady and Jeff. <laughs> Check out episode 96 for more on Silverman. In 1980, after spending $87 million to get the Olympic broadcast rights from ABC, which is a pittance compared to what they pay now, yeah. they were forced to drop the whole thing when the U.S. boycotted the Moscow Games. Stations actually began to defect mostly to ABC, and there was a real chance that NBC would go under. Silverman was out, replaced by Brandon Tartikoff, who turned around the network. Some of his calls, giving Hill Street Blues a chance, the A-Team, giving Letterman a late-night show, oh, and Thursday's must-see TV lineup, 
which owned that night for decades, taking the network to first place. His successor, Warren Littlefield, took NBC through the 90s with even more success. But by the 2000s, things were looking grim again. They had lost multiple sports licenses. The 90s hits had finished their runs with only so-so replacements. In 2003, General Electric, who had originally owned RCA in the beginning, had, had bought it back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then, but at this point, they sold half of it to Francis Vivendi, who owned Universal Pictures, and renamed it NBC Universal. By 2006, NBC was in fourth place, barely beating the nascent CW. A series of network presidents followed, but in 2009, Comcast bought out half of NBC Universal from GE, who then used the money to buy back Vivendi's share. By 2014, reality shows such as The Voice and The Super Bowl moved NBC back to first place in the all-important 18-34 to 34 demographic. CBS continues to be the most-watched network. Of course, being a TV network is not all it's cracked up to be today. One has to wonder which network will be the first to abandon traditional broadcast for the Internet. Mm-hmm. While you're wondering about that, you can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics on iTunes, or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.